Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz is off this evening. On the show tonight. Our revenues compared to last year at this time, we're down 80%. A COVID uptick leads Chicago to roll back its reopening. The impactfulness of what was done here cannot be underestimated. Sheriff Tom Dart on the sharp reduction of COVID-19 cases at the Cook County Jail. Christopher Columbus did not discover America. Details behind a violent protest over the Christopher Columbus statue in Grant Park. Vacancy rates are up and leasing activity is down in the loop. A look at the prospects for downtown commercial real estate. Elected office shouldn't be a license to enrich yourself. A look at the feds as they build a case against House Speaker Michael Madigan. Our Spotlight Politics team weighs in. For high schoolers, it gives us an amazing opportunity that not every high schooler gets. How high schoolers in Waukegan are juggling school and full-time jobs. Chicago's cultural institutions are reopening. What you can expect on your next trip. And meet a teenage mariachi group that recorded an album during the pandemic. But first, some of today's top stories. Chicago bars without a license to serve food will no longer be allowed to serve alcohol indoors in order to limit the spread of COVID-19. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says in a statement that the retightening of restrictions for bars as well as restaurants, gyms and personal services is in response to an increase in coronavirus cases. The reimposed restrictions begin Friday. And Amanda Vanicky will have more on this coming up in just a few minutes. Public health officials, meanwhile, confirm another 1,100 cases of COVID-19 in the state since yesterday and um, another six deaths. Illinois has now recorded more than 162,000 cases of the coronavirus and seen more than 7,300 deaths. And in five of the last seven days, there have been more than 1,000 new infections confirmed in the state. The Department of Homeland Security is reportedly planning to deploy 150 federal agents to Chicago, but it's unclear how they'll be used. The Trump administration has recently deployed federal agents to confront protesters in Portland, Oregon, triggering an outcry because of reports that protesters are being picked up by agents without identification in unmarked vans. Mayor Lightfoot weighed in today. We don't need uh, federal agents without any insignia taking people off the street um, and holding them, I think, unlawfully. This is a difficult time. And there are many who want to foment conflict. And unfortunately, we're hearing this on a daily basis from the president in ways that are absolutely unhelpful. And I'll go further and say absolutely dangerous. Meanwhile, 18 people have been charged in federal court with conspiring to sell heroin or fentanyl laced heroin on the northwest side of Chicago. In a statement, U.S. Attorney John Lausch says the charges are the result of a multi year investigation dubbed Operation Monticello's Revenge, referencing an alleged open air drug market on North Monticello Avenue shut down by law enforcement as part of the investigation. Much of the alleged drug trafficking is said to have occurred in the Humboldt Park neighborhood. Life in the pandemic is, as we know, ever evolving. In this case, it's two steps forward, two steps back. As you heard just a few moments ago, Chicago is rolling back on the city's reopening. Amanda Venicky joins us now with more on why and what it means. Amanda. Yes, Brandis, Chicago's public health director, Dr. Allison Arwoody, had predicted earlier this month that after seeing cases drop, that they would rise again. She even put a number on it 10 days ago. She said that if the city was going to average more than 200 new coronas, coronavirus cases a day, well, then that would bring consequences. Today, the count is at 233, and the city is making good on that threat. Not full scale. There's no new stay-at-home order, and in fact, already today reiterated her support for a hybrid model for Chicago public schools with some in-classroom learning and then some remote learning. But there are going to be some changes starting on Friday when it comes to dining out, working out, and to grooming. So let's start with the latter. Going forward, gyms that hold indoor fitness classes, well, they're going to have to limit them to 10 participants. 
and no personal services will be allowed if they require a mask to be removed. So while a haircut is fine, you are not going to be able to get, say, a facial or a beard trimmed up because you would have to remove a mask. And then also in an effort to limit parties and gatherings, residential property managers are being asked to make sure that every unit is limited to allowing in only five guests. Now, that last rule has something to do with what officials on a call with reporters today framed as bubble trouble. And what does that mean? It means that earlier in the pandemic, when everybody really was more staying at home and then starting to ease out of it, getting into social circles maybe of 10 people or a bubble, well, everybody was relatively safe. They'd been at home. But now, even if you may be keep keeping tight bubbles yourself, that is if your those bubbles will be expanding to others, co-mingling, and then you could have a pop. So that brings us to our second set of rollbacks having to do with this bubble trouble. This time it impacts bars and restaurants. As of Friday, bars that don't serve food will not be able to serve customers indoors. Bars that do serve food and well, regular world restaurants, they still will be permitted to serve customers inside, although of course at limited capacity. If you do, by the way, see somebody that is just drinking inside, don't have to worry about it and call 311 to report them if it's one of those big open window walls because that is considered for Chicago's purposes outside. Also, bars and restaurants can no longer seat parties of 10. Instead, there is going to be a max seating of six individuals. Given that Hopley, that is a bar that is known for its wide array of beers, also serves food, and also it has a patio seating option, these new rules are not going to have a huge impact on Hop Leap's COVID-19 era operations. I have to say, frankly, we don't have very many parties of 10 these days anyway. <laughs> But for owner Richard or Michael Roper, he says that he does feel for other establishments. He says for some of them, this could be an absolute disaster. He's talking about places that don't have any outdoor options in many of Chicago's neighborhood corner taverns that are a small portion of Chicago's overall entertainment and restaurant scene. But for them, the impact is huge. I... I feel for them because this is an absolute catastrophe. They're, you know, they have to close again. It means laying off the employees again. It means, you know, changing customer habits. Um, it, it's going to make it that much slower to come back. And it's not an insignificant change for Hopleaf, which he says has seen revenues fall by 80% from this time last year. He still has customers, but he says Hopleaf is not making money. For us, it's symbolically a disaster because it means we're not marching forward. We're starting to step back. And what would be the next step back would affect us very directly. You know, we all will feel a lot more positive if we continue to march forward and we have fewer infections and fewer deaths and fewer hospitalizations. And obviously that's not the case. Now, Roper says even with COVID, he still has a mortgage to pay, construction loans to pay off. And while he is understanding of the city's decision, not everyone is. Though some establishments are reluctant to talk about those frustrations for fear that they're going to be retaliated on by the city. Some bar and tavern owners say they're being unfairly maligned. While there has been an increase in COVID cases, and we're seeing that spike in the 18 to 29 year old bracket, there is no direct evidence evidence that the city could cite that that is directly linked to bars. Now, some of these bar and tavern owners say that the city should focus on the bad actors, those who are breaking the rules, and close them down. Already said, however, bars overall do have some risk factors that are why they are in the city's crosshairs. People talk louder, they're talking closer, and also when you're drinking alcohol, inhibitions go down. City officials say that they are monitoring uh, any of these venues and any scoff laws will be given warnings, citations, 
fined or even shut down, which has happened. And they say they're working on the entertainment with the entertainment industry that is on certain other options. The industry asking for things like perhaps being able to move outdoor operations if you're a place that doesn't have any or only has very limited space to say a vacant parking lot. There's a lot more on this story on our website. But with that, Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thanks. And now we go to Carol Marine and how Cook County Jail has been handling COVID cases. Carol. Brandis, in April, the New York Times called the Cook County Jail, quote, the nation's largest known source of coronavirus infections. It was an assertion that drew the outrage of Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart, who oversees that jail. Here I am trying to do a very difficult job, and I have people in the media just horribly and recklessly misrepresenting things by saying we're the COVID capital, not putting in the perspective, I was the only one testing anyone. I mean, how could I not be number one? Now, a new study authored in part by the same CDC commends the jail's efforts to limit the spread of COVID-19 over the past few months as case numbers in the facility have dropped considerably. Joining us for an update on the situation is Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart. Welcome back to Chicago tonight, Sheriff. Thanks for having me on, Carol. So today we talked to some in the civil rights community who still argue that the only reason you acted was after a court injunction in April. This is what Alexa Van Brunt of the MacArthur Justice Center said to us. There were drastic changes in that jail in the spring, but it wasn't at Dart's behest. It was because a court ordered him to make those changes. And the infection rates align uh, temporally with the changes that the court ordered. So do the infection rates align and is there validity to that contention? Yeah, Carol, I can dress this up any way you want. You know, I can tell you that I rode into this interview on my unicorn and I have him out in the parking lot right now feeding him. I don't have a unicorn. What she, she's a liar. I mean, you know, we can dress this up and say, well, that's her interpretation. That's not her interpretation. That's an outright categoric lie made up full, you know, everything. It's all documented. The court even documented it. It's in the court order itself. So why she continues to perpetuate this lie, maybe there's an element of guilt because they dragged us through all these court hearings where we had asked them at the outset, as opposed to a lawsuit, can you do what the University of Chicago and UIC have done, which is come work with us? Tell us what your concerns are. Happy to work with you. And they said, no, we want to sue you. The court came back asking, uh, telling us to do seven things, which the court itself acknowledged. Six of them, the sheriff's already doing them and has been doing them all before the lawsuit. It's all documented. I just can't believe someone could be such a bald-faced liar to say things like this, that this it's is documented. It's not true. And the seventh thing that the court ordered us was to tell us to put masks on inmates who at that point in time were positive. The only reason we weren't putting masks on was the CDC at the time, which is all over the news now because you know people have been criticizing Anthony Fauci saying you should have asked for masks quicker and he's the first one to say we didn't have them for doctors and nurses then so we told people that we didn't have enough of them so the only reason we didn't put masks on people is that they, we were told by the CDC not to do it so that was the only thing that came out of that lawsuit after loads and loads of county money hours and hours of our life and how this person could make such bald-faced lies is, is mind numbing. Is there no depth that people won't go to at times? Is this court case, however, still alive in the court system? It's alive only in the sense that it's up at the appellate court. We feel really good. It's going to get overturned. So how many cases of COVID do you have among inmates and staff right now? Uh, we have 15 uh, detainees that are COVID of that positive and of that uh, 12 of them came off the street positive because we now have, just like the country, we have more access to testing than we ever had before. So we test everyone at intake and have for months. And sure enough, in doing that, we found out that 90, no, 85% of the positives are all coming off the street. They're not coming up out as a result of infection spreading wildly through the jail. They're coming off the streets, which Carol speaks loudly to what, you know, Lori Lightfoot's been talking about lately about how this COVID is still raging through our communities. Well, we're seeing it because we're testing people and at a shocking rate, people are coming in positive. So we have those 15 people. And then as far as staff goes, we're at nine positives now on staff. Uh, and most of those are ones where, you know, 
there is a limited connection to a positive uh, in the because our, our people work at um, you know eight hour shifts and they go home and they're with their families right. they go on vacations and and, that, and Carol that's been the thing I keep trying to tell people it's like yeah we've done some amazing things we've been you know lauded as the, the the model for the rest of the country but all this will go away Carol if our population cannot be maintained at a certain level and the, the realities in the real world are going on with staff going you know we had some staff go to Arizona I think it was and you're just like oh please don't do that so switching a little bit there's been a recent spike in shootings and in homicides police superintendent David Brown has blamed in part some of that on the county's electronic monitoring program this is what he said quite recently Many of these people come right back to the very communities where they've committed their crimes to commit more crimes. So I gather you do not agree with that statement. You know, it, it's an awkward one, Carol, only because part of it I agree with. And what I agree with is that if you're, you're, you're caught with a gun with an extended magazine on it, you should not be released on home monitoring or any other form of release. That's a very dangerous person. Um, however, in, in the same thing is when the criticism of electronic monitoring came up, we were puzzled because we had no evidence of any of the people on our home monitoring. And mind you, there's two other entities that monitor people out in the community. The chief judge has his and the Department of Corrections has theirs as well. Um, but in our programming, we were unaware of anybody who was involved with the crime. And more to the point, we got we started working like a year ago with the University of Chicago with Steve Levitt, and they put together this incredible program where we have GPS on gun offenders, we live track them, and we were able to track all of the uh, ones on the program at the time, which was 500, and none of them were engaged in the areas where we were able to overlay crime statistics on top of it. And so I agree with theoretically what he's saying, but as far as it applies to our program, it did not apply to us. You mentioned the Department of Correction, and I'd like to go back to COVID for a second. Your census has increased. You've got more inmates yeah. than you did in April. And Governor Pritzker has put a hold on any state prisoners being shipped from the jail into the state prisons because they have such a problem. Have you and Governor Pritzker come to some sort of common understanding on whether that's a good idea? No, you know, Carol, it's been ridiculously disappointing because we had been working with the Department of Corrections early on when they were having some glitches. They asked us if we could just hold some detainees for a bit so they could work some things out. We did it, and we weren't looking for anything. We were just trying to help. And then in short order, sometime, I think it was the end of March, um, all of a sudden we get four-hour notice that they're shutting the prison system down. Well, guess what? Right now I'm sitting on just under 500 people that are not supposed to be in my custody. And Carol, the one thing we everybody agrees on is one of the secrets to the success we've had in stemming this has been social distancing in a jail of all places. I can't do that if I have 500 people that I'm not supposed to have. So the Illinois Department of Corrections has been of absolutely no help. They said they were gonna have some review process. To this day, they have not accepted one person from anywhere in the state of Illinois. And what I did, Carol, was to ensure that I wasn't gonna be infecting the Department of Corrections. I put all the people, at least 500 people, are in quarantine units by themselves. They have no interaction with anybody else. And I test all of them. And I told them I'll test them the day out, walking out the door as well. And we've got no feedback then whatsoever. And here's a place, the Department of Corrections, who freely will tell you they've only tested 2%. So at the time, I was being maligned because of the COVID outbreak, because I was following science and I was testing everyone. Our Department of Corrections will tell you they've only tested 2%. So you don't know what they have down there. But we, we, we only have we've about we've to, we've to, I was going to say, we've tested over 6, uh, 6,500 people already. So in 15 seconds, can you get on the phone with the governor and the two of you work this out? We have been attempting to work through this from day one. We keep telling them, what can we do? How can we put this in a form where you can take these folks, all these things, Carol, and nothing has happened. So the, the Illinois Sheriff's Association has sued them now. Tom Dart, thank you very much always for coming back and having these conversations. Thank you so much, Carol. You take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Now, Brandis, we go back to you. Thank you, Carol. What began as a peaceful protest Friday afternoon turned into a violent clash between police and protesters at the Christopher Columbus statue in Grant Park. 
The Chicago Police Department released surveillance footage today to show what police officers were up against, while videos posted to social media accounts from protesters showed a different story. Joining us now with more details is WTTW News reporter Matt Masterson. So Matt, how did uh, Superintendent Brown and Mayor Lightfoot describe what happened on Friday evening compared to those events or those accounts of events on social media? Well, both the superintendent and the mayor both had pretty strong words about the protest on Friday. The mayor today described the violent conflicts with police as anarchy, while the police department said it was an or an ambush that was organized by uh, mob actors. So there were videos that came out on Friday of the protest that were widely publicized that allegedly showed police officers assaulting protesters and also at least one reporter on the scene as well. Um, COPA, the civilian body that investigates these allegations, said it received more than 20 complaints of police misconduct from the protest. Today, the Chicago Police Department did release surveillance footage. It released about a six minute compilation of different uh, footage from the from the Friday protest, which they said shows a group of people changing into black clothes and pelting officers at the Christopher Columbus statue with frozen bottles, rocks, fireworks, and some other items as well. So uh, we heard from an activist earlier this afternoon. Uh, let's take a listen to what she said. There is no way I should have left a protest bruised and battered for exercising my freedom of speech and freedom to assemble. I am disgusted and never would I have ever thought I'd become a victim to the biggest gang in America. That's a young activist, Miracle Boyd. Matt, who is Miracle Boyd and what is her story? So Boyd is an 18 year old activist with the group Good Kids Mad City, who said that on Friday she was punched in the face by an officer and lost at least one or more teeth. Uh, today at this press conference, she spoke for, she called for that officer to be relieved of his police duties and also to meet with Boyd as she, to show what she called the power of restorative justice. Now, in her comments, she said that she hasn't felt like she's been protected from police and that police haven't protected others like her as well. And she called on Lori Lightfoot to defund the police department. And before we run out of time, I also want to mention uh, Superintendent Brown. He also spoke today. Here's what he said. When the law is being broken or has been broken, our oath demands that we act. This is not a choice for our officers. This is a requirement of our oath, even if that means protecting a statue. Just a few seconds left, Matt, but how is the city and the police department, how are they planning to handle protests here on out? Well, because of those items that were thrown at police on Friday, Superintendent Brown said he's ordered all his police officers from now on to wear any and all protective gear possible when they are handling protests going forward. He also said that people, while they do have a First Amendment pro right to protest, he said that because Friday's event was taken over by what he called organized actors, he said the department will no longer operate under the assumption that these protests are going to be peaceful. Okay, a lot to keep an eye out there for Matt. Uh, Matt Masterson, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Matt's full story on our website where you'll also find more details on weekend violence elsewhere in the city. That's at WTTW.com news. The gleaming skyline that makes Chicago an architectural wonder is primarily made up of office towers. But those glassy marvels have been largely empty since the coronavirus pandemic kept many office workers at home. Now, as companies reevaluate their real estate needs, leasing activity and demand for office space are tumbling. To talk about the present and future prospects for Chicago's downtown office leasing market, we have Chicago Cranes Chicago business reporter Danny Ecker. Hello and welcome back, Danny. Hey, so, Brandis, how are you? I'm great. Let's talk about vacancy rates over the last 10 years. Um, and there's been a sharp drop in the most recent quarter, but let's put that into perspective a little bit. Obviously, you know, and we're looking at a graph of that right now, but obviously the pandemic has had an impact on downtown vacancy rates. But how bad is it? Well, it's uh, it's the initial carnage, you could say, of um, of the pandemic. Uh, you know, the the vacancy during the second quarter rose to its highest level since 2011. So, we're getting back into that territory of uh, post financial crisis. Um, not as high as it was at its peak in 2010, but um, you know, certainly uh, we're we're uh, the, the party is over really for downtown landlords. We've gone through several years uh, recently of of companies pouring into downtown, strong job market. That's been great, a uh, great time to be uh, an owner of an office building downtown. And um, now suddenly uh, you have uh, a recession and companies obviously, more importantly, questioning what their need is for office space moving forward. Are they gonna need as much space? So there's um, you know questions about uh, 
uh, how demand and supply are really going to uh, balance out in the next few years and uh, what that's going to mean for, for companies downtown. And on that note, are owners concerned that this could last beyond the pandemic? Well, the, the concern, I think, is mostly about what companies are going to do long term. That's what's been so hard, I think, is, is, is figuring out what's short term and what's long term in terms of impact here. You've got companies that have been in this forced experiment to uh, have their employees work from home. Some have proven that they're just as productive. Some are proving that they're you know, somewhat productive, but they aren't collaborating to the same degree. And so they're going through this exercise of, you know, what's what is what's the point of our office space? What do we use it for? How much space are we going to need moving forward? And if they have an opportunity to perhaps sublease some of their space, if they don't need as much, uh, you know, that that creates a lot of inventory. And that's what landlords are most concerned about. I mean, you, you just have a lot of supply. And that's in addition to the fact that you've got uh, a few a couple of big towers that are under construction right now downtown at Wolf Point and next Union Station. There's a lot coming to Fulton Market. There's some that just and, opened recently in the Marshall Field building. So there's a lot of space. And Danny, what about properties that were already struggling to find tenants? Yeah, it's just bad timing. Obviously, if you're looking for tenants before and, and now you're trying to find uh, tenants, uh, it's it's a it's it's not a good time to be doing so. One that uh, one property we pointed to was the Civic Opera Building, which uh, has a big um, you know a lot of debt on the building, and and they are uh, they've had some vacancy. They've been trying to fill and haven't been able to. And now their cash flow, it's uh, last year wasn't enough to cover their debt payments for the mortgage. So, um, you know, there's questions about uh, whether there's going to be a lot of distress now in the downtown office market. And, you know, some tenants, they've gotten creative. They've started to sublease their own spaces. But does that spell trouble for the owners? Well, it's just competing with more uh, tenants for tenants. You know, I mean, there's a lot of really nice space. I mean, one thing that companies have done a lot of in the last few years is spend a lot of money on building out really cool offices. That's been really important to talent recruitment and retention um, at a time when uh, the, the labor market was pretty tight. So there's some really nice sublease spaces that have already come out. And that's, it's not like your landlords are competing with spaces that are outdated and heavily used. Um, there's one in Fulton Market that uh, logistics uh, tech firm called Flexport leased in a brand new building they never even moved in and it's already on the sublease market. Uh, so th there's uh, just more competition for landlords and um, it makes it a really good time to be looking for office space uh, if, if you're in the market. Wow. Yeah. Tough times unless you're in the market, like you said. All right. Uh, Crane Chicago business reporter Danny Ecker, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Brandis. And we're back with the latest on the ComEd corruption investigation in a special edition of Spotlight Politics. That's right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, what precautions are in place as museums and aquariums reopen? For high schoolers, it gives us an amazing opportunity that not every high schooler gets. How high schoolers in Waukegan juggled school and full-time jobs. and meet a teenage mariachi group that recorded an album during the pandemic. But first, the bribery deal federal prosecutors announced with ComEd Friday sent shockwaves through the political world when public official A was described as the Speaker of the Illinois House. Now there are reports that U.S. Attorney John Lausch's appeal for more evidence is proving fruitful. Here now to weigh in on a special edition of Spotlight Politics, are Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Carol Marine. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so first, let's start with Mayor Lightfoot. Um, today, she spoke out again about her concern over ComEd and any elected officials' misconduct. Here's what she said. We have to make sure that elected officials at all levels are accountable to the people that elect them. Elected office shouldn't be a license to enrich yourself at the taxpayer's expense. I've been very clear on that. Amanda, let's start with you. Give us a quick summary of the $200 million ComEd deal with the feds and tell us who pays. 
$200 million is what ComEd owes. And if in the end of three years, they pay that, but also continue to cooperate with the feds, move forward with this ethics investigation, then essentially this bribery charge will be dismissed and dropped. I'm not gonna say as if it never happened because clearly we'll have gone through all of this, but it does mean that ComEd may get through this without having to trudge through a major court hearing that said some of its former executives, well, they still may. Who's going to pay for it? Part of the agreement says that that fine cannot be put on ComEd customers. And that, by the way, is pretty much all of us. 70% of Illinois' population goes through ComEd. That said, Brandis, what makes this, I think, complicated and where some people are saying, hey, did ComEd get off easy? According to the agreement that they came to with the feds, they got $150 million in benefits through the legislation that ostensibly passed allegedly, according to at least ComEd executives, what they've admitted was with the help of having bribed House Speaker Madigan to get through two bills that made the regulation on ComEd easier and again made the company $150 million. And, and so Carol, you know, uh, U.S. Attorney John Lauch said on Friday that ComEd got this deferred prosecution deal because they are cooperating. Now the U.S. Attorney's Office doesn't go handing out deals like this uh, unless they're expecting some substantial amount of cooperation, right? Right, and ComEd had better substantially cooperate because this is a scandal. This isn't a black eye on ComEd. And despite the parent company, Exelon, saying, oh, so just a few bad actors at ComEd, Exelon, Exelon and ComEd are hand in glove. So this is a scandal. And ratepayers, as Amanda pointed out, you know, that is almost all of us. And so, yes, they better substantially cooperate. It will not save some of their former executives potentially from going to federal prison. And, and Carol, I want to come back to those former executives a little bit later on. But, you know, Heather, what do you make of U.S. Attorney John Lausch giving out uh, the FBI phone number? Is that normal? You know, it's not very common, but it's also not unusual. And I think he did it because he wanted to signal that this is an ongoing investigation. It's important to note that the very day that this agreement was released and John Lausch had this big press conference, um, House Speaker Madigan was served with several different subpoenas, which he has said he will comply with and again said he did nothing wrong. So this is very much an ongoing investigation that neither you nor I, not even Carol, knows where this is going going to lead. Um, and that's the one thing that we have to keep in mind when reporting on federal investigations is that we just simply don't know what we don't know. Oh, right. but I, I bet think, you and Carol are going to find out. Amanda, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that there is um, a certain degree of hesitancy because Speaker Madigan is still the Speaker of the Illinois House, not just that, but he is the longest serving House Speaker in the nation's history, at least documented history that we know of, and also the chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois. In other words, he's a very powerful man. And he, by the way, has denied any wrongdoing. He says he will comply with those subpoenas because he believes that they are going to show he didn't do anything wrong. So while you're starting to hear some members of the legislature, other Democrats saying he should resign if these allegations prove true, they are not calling on him to resign right now and that is a very marked distinction now the the bipartisan drumbeat for mike Mal mike madigan's ouster as you said uh it's growing louder amanda but politicians are being careful by prefacing their demands with the phrase quote if the allegations are true take a listen speaker madigan needs to speak up on this issue and if the allegations are true he must resign immediately if it turns out that these things are true um he's gonna have to resign now, you know, the GOP's position on this is going to be pretty obvious, pretty clear. But, Carol, um, we just heard from Governor Pritzker there. It's saying what a lot of Democrats are saying. They're being very careful. Um, are they equivocating or are they just relying on the adage that, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty? A little bit of both. And the fact is that they still have to pass legislation for the time being until or unless Madigan resigns through Madigan. And nobody misses the point of that. Um, Heather, uh, we know that Mike Madigan was subpoenaed uh, for information regarding Walgreens, Rush University Medical Center, and AT&T. What do we know about those subpoenas? 
Well, we don't know a whole lot, but we does show that this investigation is potentially much bigger than we had seen to this point. Um, and most of the information that had been sort of coming out in drips and drabs over the last several months, especially before the pandemic, was really focused on ComEd. Um, this suggests that federal agents are at least exploring the possibility that it just wasn't ComEd that had bribed Michael Madigan or other state lawmakers, that this was a much larger scheme. And I think that is probably giving uh, everybody involved a little bit of agita right now. And, sure. and Brandis, this is about lobbying. And we talk about lobbying. We talk about big corporate shops of lobbyists and lawyers. And right now, those lobbyists and lawyers are a focus in all of these corporations. And I might add, over at ComEd or a variety of places, every major law firm in the city of Chicago that has lawyers who were former prosecutors are getting a ton of business from these companies who need very quick emergency crisis management. Hey guys, we've got about 20 seconds left. Uh, show of hands, Mike Madigan gonna survive this politically? I don't think you ever want to bet against Michael Madigan, right? But, you know, let's also not forget that Ed Burke was indicted and then reelected. So Illinois politics, uh, never a dull moment. He'll be safe in his district anyway. Yes. We like to keep it interesting. Okay, my thanks to the Spotlight Politics team, Amanda Vinicky, Carol Marine, and Heather Sharon. Up next, students juggling school and full-time jobs. But first, a look at the weather. The pandemic has obviously upended how people work and how children attend school. For one school network, Christo Ray Schools, the students attend school and work. We visited their location in Waukegan several months ago before shelter in place orders were issued. Here's a look at how the model works and how it's changing. If he sounds like a doctor, we would get six type of patients uh, and like given the symptoms that they presented. We that's because someday this 12th grader, Edwin Morales, hopes to be one. Not bad. I've always had this like major interest in medicine and that's because it's like I think I got it from both of my grandmothers. Despite their hopes, neither of his grandmothers could become doctors. So Edwin plans to live out the family dream. He already works at Advocate Condell Medical Center, but it's not an after school job. In fact, Edwin doesn't get paid in cash, he gets paid in education. The furnace, it's going to bring it up. The other one's the air conditioner, it's going to bring it down. Okay, so we could see her glucose is the one that's... Morales and every student here at Cristo Ray St. Martin College Prep in Waukegan work a full day once a week and on rotating Fridays at a North Shore Corporation. Sophomore Araceli Gonzalez works in human resources at ACO Brands in Lake Zurich, the makers of the famous swing line stapler and Mead School Supplies. I love my work. I think um, sometimes it could seem very minimal and like it's very small, or like little tasks could seem like they're not very important, but I know that they are. ACCO is among 87 North Shore business partners that place Cristo Ray students in various departments for work. The businesses pay the school for the students' work, bringing in almost $3 million in 2019. The school says it's a significant portion of operating expenses. Fundraising and a small tuition pay for the rest. The Crystal Ray model is, I think, a real innovative uh, approach to try to get quality education to students. Mike Boyle, director of the Greeley Center for Catholic Education at Loyola University, says Catholic education often comes with some form of work. In the case of Crystal Ray, it's a clever way to overcome ever-growing funding challenges for private Catholic schools. What's helpful is to be able to find these sort of alternate funding um, opportunities, you know, such as, um, you know, what Big Shoulders is doing to support the Archdiocese of Chicago. Then we'll go through and if you can, we'll proof the names okay. together. So if you want to pull that one yeah. up. That but beyond us. paying for private school education, the corporate work study program also helps students earn work experience at an early age. They want to learn. They're so excited to be in a business, to have a day where they're in the real field learning away from school and take what they learn at school and bring it here. Senior Yesenia Gonzalez okay. says working means learning another important skill. 
time management. I think that's one of the many skills that you learn here at Cristo Rey is students are only here three or four days out of the entire week. So that means that even if we are taking higher level classes, we're still required to learn all of that within those days. In 2019, 80% of CRSM grads enrolled in a four-year bachelor's degree program, up from 21% in 2004. And what's more, 68% of students graduate college, up from 17% 15 years ago when the school began. Next fall, Edwin Morales will head off to St. Olaf College in Minnesota on a posse scholarship. And like the majority of students here, he'll be the first generation to attend. It's kind of hard and scary because you don't know what college is. Like, my parents didn't get to go to a college or university. It's kind of a lot of responsibility, but at the same time, kind of exciting. And since the pandemic set in, students have been learning from home, obviously until summer, but only a fraction had been able to do their work study jobs from home. Joining us with more about how students and the rest of the Cristo Rey St. Martin community is adjusting is Preston Kendall, the school's president. Thank you so much for joining us, Preston. So how has the pandemic changed the work study model for Cristo Rey students? Are any students, some students able to work from home? Well, thanks, Brandis. It's good to be here. And um, the work study program is, uh, for the most part, suspended. Um, I think we have maybe uh, eight jobs that are able to work effectively from home. Uh, and the rest of the students have really been, um, you know, for lack of a better term, furloughed um, for the remainder of this school year. And, you know, we're in the process right now of recontracting um, our jobs for the coming year. And obviously, uh, we're staying very close with all of our business partners because uh, many of them are not quite sure uh, what their reopening is going to look like. And so, um, you know, the reopening of the work program is dependent upon them. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of a wait and see game right now. And that work study program, it's obviously it's a very critical part of your model, both for fundraising and your, your financial abilities, but also for the students learning. Um, how does this affect their learning as well as your fundraising ability? Well, I'm, I'm very worried about it. I think, I think, you know, the, the corporate work study program is our secret sauce. It's uh, it's a, it's a, it's a critical element in our, our educational model. And um, so much of it is um, the relationships that our students are building, the social capital that they're building in the workplace. So the interaction, uh, going into these professional environments, working alongside adults, uh, discovering for themselves that they can uh, do adult work, that they belong in those locations. Um, all of that is, um, as I said before, is on hold because of because uh, of the pandemic. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm very concerned. Uh, like everybody else, we want this to reopen as soon as we can, but we want it to reopen safely. So uh, we're going to have to wait until uh, testing and, and possibly a vaccine can uh, surfaces, and then hopefully we'll be back uh, to to a new normal that includes. Uh, giving our students this, this ability to go into the workplaces, into the professional environments that they really don't have access to um, uh, themselves and in their own communities. So uh, it's it's a life changing experience. And um, now, and, and, really, and Preston, sorry, yeah. I just wanted to I wanted to ask because obviously you're a college prep school and you've had success with getting your students accepted um, into colleges. What uh, changes have some of your students had to make uh, with regards to their plans for fall and attending college? Yes, you know, this uh, class of 2020 was our first class where 100% were accepted to at least one selective bachelor's program. And um, so we were very, uh, we were very excited about that um, until uh, until this new reality hit. So for our students right now, our graduates, um, you know, many of them are looking at uh, uh, realigning their decisions. Uh, their families' financial situations have changed. So I know many have gone back and looked at uh, which college was the most affordable rather than maybe their 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 preference uh, because their family's uh, financial situations have changed. We've also been seeing a lot of students not wanting to go very far away from home. Uh, many are, if they are going away to school, have made the decision to go, you know, within three or four hours of uh, of home so that they can be close by in case anything happens. Uh, and, and we are and seeing that. You've also got sorry, Preston, but we are we're actually out of time. But I know that you do have a, a socially distant graduation uh, coming up for your students this week. Um, hopefully, that's you know one bright spot where they can celebrate their success. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us, Preston Kendall, there in Waukegan. Brandis, thank you so much.
Chicago's cultural institutions are beginning to reopen after shuttering their doors in mid-March as the coronavirus spread. But like so many other activities, there are new guidelines. During phase four of Governor Pritzker's reopening plan, museums are limited to 25% capacity. Interactive rides and exhibits must be closed and guided tours can have no more than 50 people. Here to discuss how museums are handling these changes are Darnell Williams, Director of Guest Relations at the Field Museum, Hillary Branch, Executive Director of Museum Initiatives at the Art Institute of Chicago, Robbie Amias, Davey, Vice President of Education at the Museum of Science and Industry, and Megan Curran, Senior Vice President of Marketing, Guest Relations and Sales at the Shedd Aquarium. Welcome and welcome back to Chicago tonight, all of you. Thanks for joining us. So, Megan, let's start with you, please. The shed's been open since the beginning of the month. Have the guests been coming in? Yes, um, we've been delighted to see guests come back. We opened to members on July 1st and to the general public on July 3rd. We've been really happy to see, um, though at lower capacities, significantly less than we would normally see at this time of year. Um, we've seen a lot of guests coming through, especially on weekends and really having a great time in following our guidelines and um, expressing a real appreciation of being able to come back and see the animals in person. And Darnell, the Field Museum, you guys have been open to members for just a few days now. What's it been like welcoming visitors back in? So it's been, uh, it's been very exciting to actually welcome our members into the building uh, who are truly vested and uh, love our institution. Uh, they are very appreciative of all of the protocols and guidelines that we have established, and uh, they seem to be really enjoying themselves, and so we're happy to have them back. And Rabia, you know, what precautions is the Museum of Science and Industry taking to protect the guests? So as a science museum, and I, I'm sure with my colleagues as well, we are very focused on following the guidelines laid out by the public health department and the city and the state. So masks are required for all of our guests coming to the building. We are asking for physical distancing and have plenty of additional hand sanitizer stations and signage and our staff encouraging everyone to be safe and to enjoy the museum. Um, and if you're sick, we ask you to stay home. We're asking our staff that as well as our guests so that we are protecting everyone who's in our building to have a great time. And of course, the trick is, is that folks, um, do they need to reserve tickets ahead of time? Absolutely. So that's new for us. And I think for, for many of us that we are having um, time reserve tickets for entering the building to help manage capacity, to make sure everybody can enter smoothly and safely. Uh, so everyone is able to visit msichicago.org to get their tickets in advance and prepare for an exciting experience. And Hillary, when visitors return to the Art Institute on July 30th, what can they expect there? Uh, I think a lot will actually feel familiar to them. Uh, we are also asking our visitors to buy tickets in advance or reserve tickets for those free tickets that will be available to Illinois residents July 30th through August 3rd. Um, but we've also made some changes to the galleries um, to better allow for physical distancing. And Darnell, how have guests responded to these changes so far at the Field Museum? So far, I, I think our guests are very pleased. Our members are very pleased with what we have outlined. Uh, again, we are a scientific institution, and so we are closely monitoring and following all the guidelines set out by the uh, medical experts. And I think that they're very appreciative of them. Uh, Hillary, what has been you know, the biggest challenge for the Art Institute as it adapts to these new restrictions? I think a huge challenge for us was mentally getting in a different mindset. Um, crowds and lines were for us something to be excited about. That meant that things were popular, that people were coming and visiting. Um, they're now a sign of something um, that we don't want necessarily. Um, so we want people in our building, but we've made accommodations. Um, for instance, the lines will still be there. They'll just be virtual. Uh, people will get in line via their cell phone and be able to wander around the galleries and see other things and simply get a text when and it's their turn to enter the exhibition. Um, so Megan, while you all were closed, the shed allowed animals to roam the empty aquarium. You all posted videos of penguins walking around. Uh, how has the shed been able to maintain its work uh, even though you all were closed to guests? Yeah, absolutely. While we were closed to guests, our work continued and our animal care staff continued to be on site and our conservation and research work continued. Uh, we were really thrilled to be able to share a behind the scenes look of the penguins exploring other exhibits, a behavior they often do 
even when we're open, but that was a way for us to connect guests with the animals while they were at home. And boy, were they excited to see that. We saw comments from every continent and saw exponential growth in our social media followers, which have in turn allowed us to do a virtual summer camp that not only had local participants, but participants from as far as Kuwait, United Kingdom, Brazil, and allowed us to expand our digital and virtual offerings in addition to our on-site capacity, which currently is a little bit more diminished than we're used to. Yeah, we just saw a little bit of video of those penguins and they are pretty cute. Um, but you just mentioned it, you know, the economic impact of COVID-19, you know, closing for those four months and now you can only open at 25% capacity. Um, Megan, how would you describe that financial and economic impact? It's very real. Um, at the aquarium, our, our operating budget is around $60 million and 70% of that comes from um, tickets through the gate, events, and ancillary services from our visitors visiting every day. So closing for that period of time was highly impactful. Um, and expanding our virtual presence certainly helps us find new audiences and gives us new routes to expand our virtual offerings, including paid things like our summer camps. But we do expect to end the year um, with the shortfall of about $23 million. Um, so support continues to be really important, both through um, any virtual events, tickets, or donations to organizations like ours. And now, given what we heard earlier, the city is tightening restrictions on bars as of today. Rabia, are you concerned about, you know, the rising number of COVID cases affecting your ability to remain open? We're continuing to watch the data very closely. You know, our leadership team and our staff are paying close attention to what's happening in the city, and we will continue to operate under city and state guidelines as things change. Um, and so we're just really excited to be able to open on August the 1st. Um, we'll be free for two weeks for all um, guests. And we have a lot to show. We're a hands-on museum. As you mentioned earlier, there are some um, challenges there, but we've renovated our giant dome theater. We'll be showing a movie called Superpower Dogs, which is really exciting. It talks about how dogs can save human lives around the world. Um, and quite a bit, um, the majority of the institution is open and we've got our staff ready to engage on the floor. Um, so we're just really excited about the opportunity to welcome guests back um, as soon as we can on August 1st. Lots to see, lots to do. My thanks to Darnell Williams, Hillary Branch, Robbie Amias, and Megan Curran. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. A talented band of Chicago teenagers recorded a new album during the pandemic. Expectations are high because their 2017 debut recording earned a Latin Grammy nomination. Arts producer Mark Vitale met Mar Mariachi Herencia on a rooftop in Pilsen last month. Here's another look. Three, four. Mariachi music is something that we learned and earned from our ancestors, our grandparents, our parents. Something that we are trying to bring back. Si nos deja. Mariachi consists of pride for Mexico. We are trying to connect to our roots. We are playing this wonderful, beautiful musical tradition from Mexico. And really what we're doing is that we are sharing this beautiful culture with the world. We met just a small portion of the group, which has 18 members, and music transforms every one of them. It showed me how to be a team player. It showed me a different side of myself. Most band members went through Chicago Public Schools Mariachi Heritage Program, which we featured on Chicago Tonight in 2016. Más corto, más corto. Mariachi Herencia made their new recording with remote assistance from an elder mariachi master quarantined in Mexico City. Unfortunately, uh, Don Rigoberto Alfaro, which is our arrangement composer as well as our musical director, was unable to come because of the circumstances that are happening right now as we speak. And we had a challenge, so I was given the amazing opportunity to musically guide uh, my compañeros to get this album done and send it out to the world for everyone's enjoyment. The clothing they wear is very much part of the tradition. 
It is like a way we show our pride towards what we play, which is mariachi music. It's the image of mariachi, really. This is the, what defines like the look of it. Their family members definitely approve. They're very proud of me because they see that I'm one of the only women in my family that was able to do this. And they see me as like someone that can be something in the world. It's a wonderful feeling really to get uh, kids and people from our generation to enjoy what is this beautiful genre, mariachi music. And not only that, but to also appeal to our parents and grandparents' generations as people who come from Mexico and people who come from hard times, but also kept this beautiful tradition, this beautiful genre of music with them as they came to the United States. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The new album from Mariachi Herencia is called Esencia Volume 2. And they just announced a tour beginning in late September at the University of Notre Dame. You can find out more on our website. And that's our show for this Monday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Chicago Public Schools Chief Janice Jackson on the district's plans for reopening. Plus, the closest pictures ever taken of the sun and other stories from the world of science. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.